Thank you everyone for coming. One of the things I didn't realize when I was nominated an organizer of this meeting is that I wouldn't be able to, you know, make the usual start to the presentation saying uh, thank you for the organizer for inviting me <laughs> here and how nice is Trieste. One of the things that we have been working in parallel to the autoregulation in the lab has been uh, actually the aggregation process of TDP43. Because if there is a distinguishing feature of ALS and FTD is really uh, the formation of the aggregates of TDP43 aggregates, both in the prelip, mostly in the cytoplasm, but also in the nucleus. And uh, the, the, they are the, the significance of these aggregates is really not known. There are three major possibilities and they are the same for any kind of aggregate disease like Huntington, Parkinson, Alzheimer, and also ELS and FTD. So aggregates can be protective in some way. If you have an overproduction of the protein, they will actually act as a sponge to suck it up. They can be toxic, of course, to the cell and so therefore cause cell death through some toxicity mechanism. Uh, but they can also be just an epiphenomena, so something that occurs but does not actually relate to the disease. And um, uh, of course in 2006, uh, when uh, TDP43 came out uh, by the work of Virginia Lee in the University of Pennsylvania, Manuela Neumann, one of the major uh, issues that were actually uh, confronting people who decided to work on TDP43 was the all the different possibilities through which the protein can actually go from a soluble condition to an aggregated uh, condition. And uh, now there are many of them that have been described, but already in 2010, from the work we did in the laboratory with Yunayala, we knew that it was the sequence of the protein was very important. So if you had some C-terminal mutants, then these mutants would have the tendency, once they were transfected into cells, to aggregate uh, very much, both in the cytoplasm and both in the nucleus. Um, therefore, uh, what we were doing at the time is really focusing on this sequence, the C-terminus of TDP43, and trying to find out what were the particular amino acids and regions responsible for the aggregation. And we already had some clue from some previous work in the lab when we were trying to map the um, interacting region between TDP43 and HNRMPA2 because you see here that if you have a very simple band shift analysis where you have the UG, free UG here in this position, the uh, UG is bound by TDP43 to give a band shift. If you add to this mix HNRMPA2, you have a super shift, the formation of a super shift. Um, using a peptide mapping approach, we ended up with a rather short polypeptide from 331 to 366, uh, where if it was added to the band shift mix, it was capable of completely abolishing the super shift. Uh, uh, of course, nothing happened with the control peptide, but at the same time, you see that there was the formation of this uh, um, kind of aggregated material in the wells. And so, uh, what we wanted to try, you know, because all this was made in vitro, is to see if we could, using this sequence as a base, if we could reproduce this aggregation into cells. And therefore, after making a few constructs and testing them, uh, we ended up with uh, an AGFP molecule that is um, that carries 12 repeats of this 331 and 366 region. And when this was transfected into cells, you see here the control EGFP that is basically everywhere in the cytoplasm in the nucleus. When this new construct was transfected into cells, you see that there is, well, first of all, a punctuate uh, uh, pattern, and that this pattern was also fairly well co-localizing with the endogenous TDP43. Although, using this construct here, we didn't see any uh, 
depletion of the endogenous TDP43 from the nucleus. But these aggregates uh, were really promising because uh, what one characteristic of the aggregates in the patient is the fact that they are ubiquitinated and the, the TDP is also apparently phosphorylated. So when we added uh, the EGFP12 per QN effector, the aggregates were also mimicking the behavior of the uh, pathological aggregates because they were both obucutinated and also phosphorylated. Now, in these conditions, so when there is still a lot of TDP43 inside the nucleus because this aggregation process is not 100% uh, efficient, uh, we didn't detect any toxicity. So apparently the aggregates in this case were not toxic. Uh, what therefore we decided to do in order to mimic a little bit better the situation in the patient, so to make sure that a lot of the nuclear TDP43 was actually taken up, picked up by the aggregates, uh, we made a series of very uh, complex uh, constructs that were all based on TDP43 and to which we added at the C terminus this 12 per QN effector and then we deleted the various different regions. And uh, I won't show you the data but certainly one of the best uh, uh, effectors that we found uh, was the uh, by coupling the 12 per QN to the entire sequence of TDP43 and you can see that uh, the difference from the construct shown that I showed before with the EGFP here you have the cell we made stable cell lines with this construct so the cells in the absence of tetracycline this is, this is the endogenous TDP43 that's almost all in the nucleus when we added tetracycline the 12 per QN started to be expressed and you can see that there is a fairly dramatic shift in the lo localization of the endogenous TDP43 as you can see here in the merge image uh, where most of TDP43 now is sucked up in the cytoplasm and a lot of the nuclei seem to be completely empty of uh, the endogenous protein. So uh, from the point of view of the pathology of course we were very interested in uh, trying to understand what were the consequences and one difficulty in trying to understand what were the consequences is that at the moment we don't have a huge number of, uh, for example, alternative splicing events, endogenous alternative splicing events that are directly controlled by TDP43. So one year ago, uh, Philip Kalle in Tübingen uh, published uh, PolDeep3 SCAR and you can see here that when you, what happens is that uh, TDP43 binds near to the 5' splice site of exon 3 here and it's actually promoting the inclusion of this exon and so we immediately tested what was going on at the endogenous level in the presence of our aggregates and you can see that we managed actually to get a very nice decrease, uh, actually the complete loss of exon 3 inclusion, so all the TDP43 from the nucleus was trapped in the cytoplasm and was unable to drive the recognition of exon 3 and this one we could not just only see at the level of the RT-PCR uh, but we also could see it at the level of the western blood where you have a total shift of the uh, uh, protein isoform that uh, expresses exon 3 uh, to the protein isoform where exon 3 is actually missing. Uh, of course we wanted to know uh, if there were other examples of this and so we took advantage of a, a microarray, an exon junction microarray analysis that was also funded by Eurasnet a few years back that we have been validating and analyzing since then and basically what this microarray gave us uh, using a variety of stable cell lines is quite a number of additional uh, alternatively spliced exons that can be directly modulated by TDP43. And uh, I won't go into the detail of, of all of them, but basically you see that the pattern is always the same. This is the normal, the control lane. So if you remove TDP43, either you have an increase in the alternatively spliced exon or a loss in its inclusion. If you put back a SI resistant TDP43 then this, uh, uh, the, the action of the SI against the endogenous TDP43 is completely recovered and if you put back a, a mutant TDP43 that cannot bind to RNA then there is no effect with respect to the uh, SI TDP43 uh, 
uh, induce change. Uh, and so, uh, how does the splicing of all these genes now compare with the splicing uh, when we have the expression of the 12 per QN aggregates? And you can see something that is very interesting. So, first of all, very pleasingly, most of the splicing that we see in the presence of the aggregates is uh, mimicking very closely the effect that we see when we deplete the endogenous TDP43. But this is not true for all the targets. So, for example, for MAD here, you see that there is a small decrease in exon inclusion, just like with the sRNA, but you have a, also something else going on at the same time, and this is the activation of a pseudo-exon in the downstream intron. And, of course, uh, what this one is actually telling us, and this is something that we are currently still investigating, is that uh, when you have the formation of the aggregates in the cytoplasm induced by the 12 per QN, not only TDP43, the endogenous TDP43 gets trapped in the aggregates, but there are also other proteins that are probably being trapped in the aggregates, and these could account for the difference in uh, splicing behavior between the sRNA and the aggregates. And the proof of this, uh, the preliminary experiment that, that is proving actually this point, is when we did a pull-down analysis of the 12, PN, 12 per QN construct uh, compared to the wild-type protein, and you can see that in the presence of the aggregates, you have the loss of many natural endogenous TDP43 interactors, but you also have the appearance of some novel interactors that in this case we actually managed to uh, find the identity and it's HSP70 and is also present in the aggregates together with uh, the 12 per QN and the TDP43. So uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, one of the things, of course, in order to test what is the pathological significance of the aggregates, it's especially important to actually have uh, a, a a model, an animal model. And uh, th there is a mouse model coming up that is based on the 12 per QN, but of course that takes uh, a very long time. And in the meantime, as we were waiting, in collaboration with Fabian Feguin at the neurobiology lab in ICGB, what we managed to do is a fly, a fly that was expressing a, uh, specifically in the motor neuron the 12 per QN, eff 12 per QN effector. And you can see here that uh, the 12 per QN effector in the larval uh, motor neuron is actually behaving like in the uh, normal culture cells, so it's making aggregates in the cytoplasm, and these aggregates, it's not shown here, but uh, I'll show you in a later slide, are actually capable of sequestering the endogenous TDP43 uh, from the nuclei. Uh, and uh, you can see it in the movie, expressing of these aggregates uh, inside five different lines of drosophila is actually providing a phenotype that is extremely similar to ALS or not. Um, because, you see, the control flies here are perfectly capable of... Uh, <laughs> this is the audio, <laughs> uh, So, the, uh, no, it disappeared. But, <laughs> but anyway, so you see it better in the graph. Um, less visual, but it doesn't disappear. And, and it doesn't speak as well. Um, so, you can see that uh, in a gradual way, during time, uh, um, you, you have in the flies that are expressing the 12 per QN, 12 per QN effector uh, in the motor neurons, you have a gradual loss in the climbing. But also, you know, we are talking about the uh, larvae where the 12 per QN is actually depleting the uh, endogenous TDP43 from the nucleus. And so, one of the other things, in order to understand exactly what aggregates are doing, is to actually do something else. So, uh, have a fly that is overexpressing TDP43 in the eye, and the reason we cannot overexpress it in the entire body is because TDP43 overexpression is absolutely lethal. So, the flies that overexpress TDP43 in the eye, you can see that they have a, a huge amount of necrosis going on. And uh, if you cross these flies that have this phenotype with the flies that are expressing the 12 per QN effector, you see here that um, all the excess TDP43 that is made in the eyes is actually sucked up by the 12 per QN effector as a sponge, and you can see that the phenotype of the eye is going back to normal. So basically, the model, and I'm reaching the conclusion now, that we are actually 
trying to prove and validate a little bit better, but the model we are working on is that in normal conditions you have a natural tendency of TDP43 to aggregate in either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus, and this natural tendency is basically controlled both by the autoregulation pathway but by the natural uh, protein degradation path pathways like autophagy and the proteasome system when you have for whatever reason because you have an excess of transcription or, or autoregulation breaks down you have an excess production of TDP43 there is this tendency of form the aggregate that in the initial stages is actually acting as a protector because the uh, the aggregates will keep uh, uh, the, and the soluble TDP43 levels at a more or less normal level and therefore all the normal processes will be maintained but it's only when these aggregates get much bigger so in a kind of very vicious uh, uh, autoregulatory um, uh, defect uh, it's only when these aggregates become much bigger that the uh, transcription and autoregulation cannot actually create any more soluble protein because it's all completely sucked up by the aggregate and therefore you start to have misregulated mis nuclear and cytoplasmic functions and probably uh, the pathology. And I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.